A lawsuit filed against the South Carolina Republican Party accuses the organization of violating its own rules and state election law. Suit is in response to the state's decision to forego a presidential primary in 2020. South Carolina is one of the 37 states and territories who decided to change rules that ultimately prevent a challenge to President Trump. But some states like Florida are refusing to cancel their primary, saying regardless of the challenger, President Trump will win. Joining us via Skype to discuss his bid against the president is former South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford. Welcome, sir. My pleasure. So what's going on with your home state there? Are they turning their back on you? Well, you know, powers that be tend to circle the wagon around political time, and that's what they're doing. Hmm. Well, so, Governor, what do you say is the central driver behind your candidacy? I mean, it seems to many like, A, the GOP doesn't particularly want to challenge to President Trump. His, uh, his approval ratings within his own party are very high. And there's, a, there's accusations against you and Joe Walsh and, and many others that you're all just trying to get CNN or MSNBC contracts. Uh, well, let me say definitively, I'm not trying to get a CNN contract. Mm -hmm. but what I am trying to do is raise awareness on debt deficit government spending that's not talked about in the Republican Party that has historically been one of the hallmarks as to what the party was about. I think the, the Republican Party has lost its way under this administration, uh, not just on debt and deficit, but frankly, with regard to are we inward versus outward looking? I mean, this whole ramp up on tariffs is beginning to impact the economy in substantive ways, as has been highlighted by the Wall Street Journal as late as last Friday with their editorial. I, I think that if you look at the institutions, uh, the, the president's doing damage to really the glue that held our system together for 200 years. And I think we've been misguided with regard to tone. I mean, I, the way in which certain things are said turns off an audience. And I saw that in this congressional district that I used to represent as soccer moms and working moms and young millennials turned away in droves, and as a consequence, the district went Democratic for the first time in 50 years. Hmm. Hmm. What's your position on uh, Democrats launching this impeachment inquiry surrounding the president's dealings with Ukraine? Well, I, you know, I'm not going to prejudge the process. I, I think that they're very serious charges when you have a sitting president go to his attorney general and, and, uh, and then turn to a foreign power and say, help me look at a, a, a political vote. That's the allegation. That's a serious hmm. allegation. I believe in innocence until proven guilty, and so we'll see where things go. But uh, the idea of it being investigated, I think it needs to be. Well, so, Governor, what about the underlying accusations against Hunter Biden? Do you think that it's a problem that Joe Biden, your potential opponent's son, was sitting on the board of a Ukrainian energy company getting paid $50,000 a month? Of course. It, it, mm. it, it, it reeks of nepotism and good old boy politics that I think everybody struggles with. So you have two concurrent problems. I'm not in any way diminishing mm -hmm. that. But you do have a real problem when the president goes and says, let's 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 go help a foreign power investigate a domestic political foe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Governor, how do you think we ended up in this place where Donald Trump would be president and have essentially, you know, hijacked the Republican Party and taken it, I think, in a very different direction? Out of desperation. Desperate people do desperate things. And I, mm -hmm. I, I get it. I mean, the Trump voter got to the point where, in, uh, in essence, political rage was boiling over because they saw a lot of people who said one thing and did another in politics. And a lot of it wasn't working for them. The erosion yeah. of the American dream in economic terms, uh, the, 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 the way in which people seem to at times look at the, the, the coasts and not the heartland of America and their priorities and what was important to them. I get it. But what you don't want to do is throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that too much of what the administration has done falls into that category of in occasionally and oftentimes right intent, but, but, but so much so that you, 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 you're indeed throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, think about it. When the president of the United States says that Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, is in essence, quote, an enemy of the state, you're doing erosion to one of the institutions of our government. But governor I, guess, I guess what I'm really curious about, though, is if you have any sort of self-reflection about what the, the GOP party that you were a part of and that you were a, a leader in, like the ways in which that paved the path to Donald Trump. Do you see that there were, do you see that any issues in the direction of the Republican Party when you were governor and the type that you would, of leadership that you'd want to bring back? Um, yeah, I, I, again, as I just said a moment ago, people have gotten frustrated with the way in which 
folks in government say one thing and do another. Um, take, for instance, spending. Everybody's talked on both Republican and Democratic sides. Oh, we got to do something about it. And nobody does. And people see an ever escalating rise of tide with regard to government's cost and ultimately uh, the, the cost on behalf of their children in their lives. I have to and, wonder, though, Governor, I have to wonder, I mean, how is the response to the Trump presidency that we need less spending? You just talked about, you know, the lack of economic dream, the frustration of so many. This is the same Tea Party and Reagan message that the party hammered home for 30 years and Mitt Romney lost definitively to Barack Obama on. So how do you see our current system and you say that, Actually, a reversion to those to that strategy is what is needed to retake the the White House and the Republican Party. Well, I didn't say that pandering yeah. won't get you far. Let's be hmm. clear: pandering will always get you far in politics. Hmm. But but what I would say is reality matters, and the reality is if we stay on the course that we're on in economic terms, there is going to be profound damage for every one of us and that we're walking our way toward the most predictable financial crisis in the history of man. And those are not my words, but those are the words of Erskine Bowles, who is one of the co-leads of the Bowles-Simpson report. It's telling to me that Admiral Mike Mullen, who is the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when asked what's the biggest threat to American security, answers not the Russians, not the Chinese, not the Taliban, he answers the American debt. And so I, I think that every family, uh, every business, every country, get to a tipping point wherein they have to ask this central question of do we continue to pander or do we go back? In fact, there was an interesting book entitled This Time It's Different, written by a professor from Harvard and a professor from the University of Maryland. And what they talked about in that book was they, they chronicle 800 years of financial history as it relates to governments, how every civilization got to a tipping point we're in the head to make that critical decision. So what do you we cut? Because the big, the big budget items are the military and healthcare, basically. So what do you cut? Both. I mean, it's not cut. So do you cut Social it, Security? Do you cut Medicare? Wait, wait, no, no, wait, wait. Yes. It, they, but all systems have to be reformed. And anybody who tells you the opposite is lying to you. You know the math as well as I know the math. Mm -hmm. Entitlements drive our spending equation. What the President of the United States has said is we're not going to touch the very things that drive our spending. And there's been equal pandering on the Democratic side, if not more so, as they proposed uh, an ever long list of more versus more. As and military gone, spending? As, Do you cut military spending as well? Everything. So let me be specific. Yeah. When I was in Congress. I offered what was called the penny plan. And what it says is if, if we all got in the boat together as Americans, not, you know, I protect defense and we cut domestic discretionary or we uh, offer things to rural, but we cut on urban or Republican versus Democrat, go down the list. But if we all got in the boat together, would you accept one penny of cut out of every dollar of federal benefit for every program out there in the event that Congress didn't come up with targeted cuts? Mm -hmm. I believe that they would if people saw it as a systemic threat, our spending that is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, and, and so that, that's, in fact, what I propose. Yeah. But, yeah, we we got to cut everything. Well, All thank right, you Governor. so much for joining thank us, Governor. You. Very Good much luck. appreciate it. Yep. My pleasure. Take care. Absolutely. Next on Rising, after announcing a multitude of other plans, Senator Elizabeth Warren has a vision for labor. The Working Family Party's Joe Dinkin goes over the specifics with us and explains how it compares with the other 2020 contenders when Rising returns.